And so we would like to welcome all of you to this month's uh, Nurse Users Groups Now rebranded community call from our monthly meeting. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And we will go on. And so before we continue on, just a little reintrodu reintroduction for anyone that's new that are joining us um, on the call. Uh, we will start with a few introductions of myself and my colleague, Dr. Lippi Gupta. Lippi, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Sure, yeah. So um, yeah, my name is Lippi. Um, Charles and I are both science engagement engineers in the user engagement group. Um, and my background is in physics. Um, was working on some machine learning techniques for um, actually understanding like how we can operate or control particle accelerators. Um, so I was down at Slack National Lab and even worked at Fermilab and Argonne National Lab for a while. So I've been around the national labs for a long time. Um, I literally, any noodle-based dish I will love, like ramen, uh, pad thai, uh, like Italian pastas, anything with noodles in it is my favorite. And um, my favorite sci-fi movie is The Martian. I It's funny because in a previous talk I gave during our new user training, I was sort of teasing The Martian because they show some, you know, silly like science stuff where someone is like, plug their laptop directly into a supercomputer. Um, but I do that lovingly because I, I do like this movie. Okay, awesome, awesome. And everyone, I'm Charles Lively. Uh, as Lippy has stated, we're both science engagement engineers. My background is in computer engineering with respect to performance modeling and op optimization of scientific applications. and energy aware computing and also interested in researching and learning about applications of game theory and uh, favorite foods. Um, I'm vegan. I'll eat seafood every now and again. So I love to explore, try new recipes and whatnot. I'm more of a cook at home versus eating out. So I love to experiment. And my favorite sci-fi movie would be Contact, Jodie Foster, Matthew McConaughey, classic I can watch it over and over again. And I, as, as a matter of fact, I do. So, and Charles took mine, actually. I would have said contact first, but because Charles had already written contact, I was like, okay, so to think of another one. We, we could have <laughs> it's been. It's why Charles um, and I work so well together. We're like the same person. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> so we want to welcome you all to the February community call. And if you are new to nurse, you might not know what a community call uh, is and why it's different from what we used to have on our monthly meetings. And so Lippy, do you want to just share a little bit about why we're kind of rebranding and refocusing how we engage with uh, our user group? Yeah, why? sure. So Really, you know, previously they were called monthly meetings. And one thing we didn't want was for it to seem like some kind of chore to attend or something, you know, it's not that it's meant to be um, somewhere where people can maybe find some collaborators, get some good information, um, ask questions, participate, um, maybe in a different way than than someone would during a meeting. Um, and so going forward, we're going to actually change the the way that these calls are held. Um, every other month, you'll see something more like a gathering of people at NERSC who work on a specific topic. Um, for example, maybe everyone who's using AMRX or everybody who uses MATLAB or everybody who uses VASP um, and bring those people together to kind of get to know each other and um, discuss what might be helpful for them from a perspective of working at NERSC. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different. Um, in the future, we hope that there will be a lot more time for participation and, you know, maybe like breakout rooms where people actually are discussing something that they're working on. Um, so really changing it from being kind of a, a meeting where we're just talking to people and a community call where the community is actually talking to each other. And our, our goal and our vision is just to try to foster more collaboration to enable uh, more scientific advancement and research advancement as well. So 
if you have any ideas of what you would like to see or some of the different types of nurse community calls you would like to see moving forward, we would love um, any recommendations or feedback or thoughts um, as we try to try some new things and try to get people more connected and understanding what we do in our different areas. So we're looking forward to a lot of the exciting things we have planned over the year. So it'll be fun. So continuing on. So our pipeline agenda for today is uh, typical as usual. Again, we, we encourage everyone to interact and participate. Um, come on camera, speak, uh, ask questions if you have any. And um, we're just looking forward to uh, a great uh, meeting today. Um, on it, we have a, a few uh, topics that we'll be discussing outside of the usual announcements and calls for participation. Uh, specifically, one of our staff members will be doing a, uh, a, a brief experiment on tree testing for our documentation at NURSE. And then we also will kick off our talks for our NURSE Early Career Award winners. And so we will have today presenting uh, Bikash Kanango from the University of Michigan, who is a high impact scientific achievement early career award winner. And his talk is gonna focus on his work towards uh, large scale modeling materials at quantum accuracy. So we're looking forward to a great call. So let's continue. And before we get started, we'll kick things off with a few icebreakers. So I personally love this question because it kind of makes me reflect on where where I was and where I've come. Um, but I'm curious to know uh, from everybody, what did you want to be when you grew up, if not what you are now? And if you can't think of your own answer, you could try to guess ours. Um, so Charles and I have both put a clue as to what we wanted to be when we were younger. Um, and if you want to unmute and share your answer, that's fine. If you want to unmute and try to guess one of these, that's also fine. Um, it's a pretty small group, so I think it's totally fine for anyone to just shout it out. Um, or you can put it in the chat if you feel more comfortable with that. Does anyone have any thoughts? Well, I will go first. Well, does anyone have an, a guess for what I want it to be? <laughs> well, it's kind of like an astronaut. <laughs> Annette, you are just too brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Anyone that kind of knows me as knows the story of how I love wanted to go to space camp when I was younger. And my dad gave me a decision of you either can go to space camp or I can get you a computer. And mm -hmm. I chose a computer. Oh, very nice. Okay, no one can guess mine. It's hard to see, but these are like Greek um, people, Greek gods, um, something along those lines. Koichi's saying he's working on becoming a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> no one has a guess? Nobody wanted to be anything when they grew up. They just wanted to just hang out, which is fair. Honestly, that's also fair. <laughs> wanted to be a Greek interpreter. <laughs> oh, that's a that would be cool. No, I okay. Anyone? Any other guesses? Lisa, you have a guess. I can see you have a guess. No, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be when I was very young. I I didn't know what it was called, but I loved Greek mythology, so I wanted to be a Greek mythologist, which later I learned would be called, you know, studying classics. Um, but sadly, I didn't do that. I did briefly in college um, study medieval studies and old English, and I could have gotten a medieval studies minor, um, but then I learned I had to. I would have had to take an old Norse as a course, and I just wasn't really ready to commit to learning Old Norse, so um, <laughs> decided to change my mind. Um, okay, anyone else want to share? But, um, Annette, what about you? Well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a philologist. A philologist, what is that? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I was really into J.R.R. Tolkien, and that was basically his job. He was studying the history of words. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Edited That's great. dictionaries and stuff like that. Oh, very nice. Okay. Okay. My and sister, when she was little, she wanted to be a fire hydrant. <laughs> I knew somebody who wanted to grow up to be a turtle. So, you know what? I think that's fair. Um, oh, Marie-Lou Marie -Lou is saying she wanted to be a marine biologist because the idea that most of Earth was water is unexplored was so intriguing. I agree. I actually wanted to be a marine biologist, too, for a little while. Um, but then I realized I'm very scared of deep water and then decided that that's probably not good for me. Um, that's a great answer, Marie-Lou. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, they say we know more about space than we do about the deep ocean. Yeah. Put it into yeah. perspective. That's why astrobiologists study space and like mostly deep ocean because it's so like we really don't know anything about that. That's awesome. Okay, we should move to our next one. Right. Okay, this is an important question. Um, will you be seeing Dune 2 this weekend? If you haven't already, I know some people, depending on where you live, may have already seen this movie. Um, technically comes out on the first, but as with many of these things, you may have seen it earlier. Um, or if you're not seeing the movie, have you read the book? And if not, um, why not? For the record, I already have my tickets to see it on Saturday. <laughs> Has anyone read the book? You can raise your hand if you've read the book. Okay, I think so. I saw someone raise. Okay, a couple of people raised their hand. Okay, fantastic sci-fi book by Frank Herbert. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, this, you know, parts of it are maybe a little problematic, but it's an incredible book. Um, and the movie is very epic as well. So, okay, so nobody's going to go see it this weekend, just me? I will probably catch it. I tend to wait a week or two, so okay. I will catch it before the end of the, for, well, end okay. of March, yes, we're starting a new month, so, yeah. Okay, great, okay. Uh, but, you, but you've but you seen part one? Yeah, of course. Okay, good, 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 yeah, it's a two-parter. Now, most movies these days are multiple parters, because that's how they make money, um, <laughs> but that way the movie can be, you know, this one is three hours, the per, pre, per, previous one is two and a half hours, so they can be much longer. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for participating. Feel free to move on. We got to keep on schedule, I think. So thanks. Our, yeah, well, we will continue on with our announcements, updates, and calls for participation. A few items. Um, again, please note that all of these updates are provided within our weekly email that goes out every Monday. Um, if you are not reading your weekly email, you're missing out. You're missing out on a lot of good, useful information. So we have a few um, nurse updates uh, with regards to uh, allocations. Um, if you are interested in applying for a quantum information science research allocation, that is due by Friday. Nurses soliciting uh, proposals for the area of quantum information science. This is a open call, which means that it is not limited to current nurse users. Okay, uh, details are in the weekly email. Um, as well as we have su nurse summer internship opportunities available geared towards undergraduate and graduate students that will be enrolled full-time in the fall. Uh, qualifications and pay vary based off of experience and the project that you're working on and years of education. Um, we also will have the 2024 NESAP pathfinding projects um, uh, that have been announced 23 teams were selected from 52, I believe, that applied. Um, and so the teams that have won, um, whose, whose projects were accepted, will have access to um, a number of, of valuable resources available at NURSE, um, staff, postdocs, over 200,000 GPU node hours, all available on Perlmuter. So congratulations to those pathfinding teams. Um, as well as um, attention, vast users, VAS 6 is now available on GPUs at NURSE. Uh, if you have a existing uh, VAS license, you can apply to uh, have access to the optimized um, application that is available and installed on Perlmuter. 
uh, you can request access. The form to request it is provided in our weekly email. Do we have any questions or any um, anything to add to those updates from anyone on the call? Okay, we will continue on. So we have one call for participation. Nominations for the George Michael Memorial HBC Fellowship are now open. The nominations are due by May 1st, and this fellowship will honor exceptional PhD students uh, whose research focus is on HPC computing areas. Uh, there is a $5,000 honorarium and recognition by the ACM, IEEE CS, and ACM SIG HPC um, organizations, as well as you will get paid uh, expenses to attend SC24. Um, and recipients will be honored at the Supercomputing Conference Awards Ceremony, which will be in Atlanta, Georgia this year. Okay. A few Perlmuter announcements. Um, Perlmuter Scratch Purge is now being enforced. Um, it was started being enforced February 1. Um, as part of our policy, we reserve the right to delete any files from Scratch that have not been accessed for eight weeks or longer. So please make sure that you back up your data accordingly. Um, and if you are not regularly using it, um, uh, to make sure that you have it backed up. Uh, Podman HPC is now back available again on Perlmuter after a a brief problem and outage. It was a rolling reboot was done to apply a fix and Potman has been re-enabled for everyone to access. Uh, additionally, we want to keep everyone in mind that we this is our 50 year anniversary at NURSE. So please join us for our annual uh, NURSE user, users group meeting in person. It will occur October 22nd through 24th at Berkeley Lab. And we'll have a number of exciting activities and events planned to help uh, relive history and look forward to everything that NURSE is doing moving forward with the DOE, okay? Uh, a number of different trainings that are also being offered. Um, specifically, NURSE is offering a Forge tool set for debugging and profiling training. Um, that will occur on March 13th. Uh, the goal of this training is to teach useful features um, in the tools and to demonstrate how to accomplish appropriate uh, debugging and profiling on Perlmuter. Uh, we also have the AMREX tutorial going on March 4th. This will be a part of the performance portability series, which is a joint training series between OLCF nurse and as well as ALCF Argonne. Um, we also will have the programming parallel programming in Fortran two-day virtual hands-on training. If you are a Fortran enthusiast or you are looking to learn about parallel programming in Fortran, then you are encouraged to register and join uh, for this uh, two-day virtual hands-on training as well as a total view uh, training for debugging um, and analyzing uh, any memory problems and GPU problems uh, will be occurring on May 13th. This training will allow for you to learn some of the tools and capabilities of using total view to debug your applications. So for more details and links, uh, please be sure to refer to our weekly email uh, for additional information about these training events. As well as we have uh, a few uh, outages that will be occurring over the next month, uh, please be sure to refer to our weekly email. And you can also always get the current status of any of nurse resources through our message of the day um, that you can access through our live status page. Okay, so that that pretty much covers most of our announcements, trainings, and offerings. Uh, did we have any any clarification or any add-ons from any nurse staff or anyone else on the call? 
I'm noticing that Mary Lou has her hand up. Is that intentional? Oh, I'm not. It's probably from our last segment. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, we will keep it moving. And Annette, you can go ahead and take it away. Now we will talk about tree testing with our very own um, Annette Kleiner. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is just a little bit about me. Um, I'm part of the Data and AI Services Group at NERSC. I've been at NERSC uh, for a little over a dozen years. Um, started out at the lab as a web developer and worked at the Advanced Life Source and at the Joint Genome Institute for a little while each. So I've always been very interested in user interface design and development and also kind of specializing in data visualization work and a strong interest in fair data. So for food preferences, I'm your basic omnivore. I'll eat just about anything, but I really, really love Thai food. Um, and favorite, you know, I was thinking favorite sci-fi movie and I thought of Contact too, but I was like, oh, everybody else is talking about Contact. So I'm just going to do my favorite movie, which is a Buster Keaton movie called The General from 1926. Uh, silent movie, silent comedy. Um, all right, next. So uh, this tree testing segment here is just a little test to try to figure out whether a new design that we've been thinking of for our documentation website is actually an improvement or not. <laughs> uh, and what we'd like to do is to have each of you uh, be test subjects for about five minutes working through these, these questions. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're testing the organization of the site. We're not testing you. Nobody's going to worry about like whether one person performed better than another. It's really about finding out how well this system is actually working. Um, and, and we're only testing just the, the hierarchical structure of navigation on it. So you'll see that there are 10 very short questions um, that you will try to answer by clicking through this tree. Um, and at, when you get to the end of it, you also have a chance to type any textual feedback that you want to give us. Uh, while you're working through it, you know, if you get frustrated or you just don't feel like keeping on going, you can quit anytime, that's fine. Uh, you can also skip a task with the skip button. Um, but of course, we would like for people to try to finish each task so that we get more information. Um, we'll get to see the path that you took when as you went through this, and we'll learn from it like where you are trying to find something, see how well that lines up with where we put it. Um, so actually, can I, Charles, can I share my screen briefly? I want to give a, a little bit of a demo. Of course, of course. Let me, and then I will... Are you already as a co-host? Yeah, I seem to be able to. Okay. That's cool. All right. Can people able to see that all right? Yep. Cool. Okay, so this is just what you'll see. Um, I'm going to give you a password. I'll just type it into the chat, but I'll also enter it here. <laughs> it's docs experience, all one word, lowercase. Um, and when you enter that, you go into the site. You get a little bit of instructions. This is a slightly simpler version, um, but you can enter a name. You don't even have to use your own if you don't want to. Uh, and then you'll just get asked some questions like this. Where would you expect to find how to play online games? So you're gonna start the task and then you have this little tree that you get to navigate through. So I think it's gonna be how to play games, how to study, probably how to play games. Well, how to play online games, that's pretty likely. So then you get a little button that says I'd expect it there when you're when you've clicked on a node that you can actually say, yes, this is my answer. Um, if I wanted to get a different one, obviously that would still be. But uh, notice uh, when I'm on how to play games, that button goes away because it's expecting you to hit a leaf node. So I yeah, pick that one and I hit I expect it there. And you'll go through 10 tasks like that. And then at the end, you can say this will spawn or whatever and send your feedback and that'll be it. All right, so that's all I needed to share. And then I'm just gonna put into the chat the link to the study and hopefully each of you can take a few minutes to go through this now. And 
just a reminder, Doc's experience is the password. Oh, but that's lowercase. <laughs> Don't know why I uppercased it. Okay, awesome. And so is there um is there a uh time frame or when this will no longer be working or you do you want everyone to do it now or oh I'd like people to do it now, yeah. Okay, so do we want to take uh five minutes and just have people try to go yeah. through it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's everyone, if you could please click on that link and we can go through this exercise really quickly. And of course, if you have questions about it, let me know. Oh, when I, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, helpfully capitalized that for me. <laughs> Good old. Is there a way to delete right. that? Yeah. Um, I can copy and quote it. Yeah, it doesn't even let myself delete it either. Yeah. Oh, well. So this is where I wish I had the Jeopardy music <laughs> in the back. <laughs> so what are some of the... um? From the results, what are you looking, what type of insights would this type of testing provide you? Yeah. Uh, I understand it's going to help you to determine like um, how our users are able to perceive the navigation, but how do you get to what what type of insights does this type of testing typically give you? To yeah, get that, that's a great question. So the way this tool works, it actually tracks as you go from node to node. And so even before you click, I choose this one, um, it's actually tracking what other things you looked at. So it shows me your path through it all. And so if you took a very circuitous path to get at it, even though you may have gotten the answer that we wanted you to find, um, it would still be instructive to us that you went somewhere else first, because that means that that's where you're thinking that maybe it belongs. So you do this with enough people and you start to see maybe there's a pattern. Maybe a whole lot of people thought that this same place that you looked first is actually where where we should put it. Um, so then we can, we can do that. And we can also uh, look at how long it takes people to work through it. So we can see if people were having a hard time, if it's taking a lot longer than we expect. Uh, and we can see percentage of completion um, how many people finished the task, how many people skipped it. Um, we can see a thing called directness, which is basically a measure of how uh, how successfully you found it without diverting into a different pathway. Um, because actually, you know, in, in user experience design, uh, there's kind of a an old thought that uh, that maybe, everything should be the fewest number of clicks possible to get at. But it turns out what really matters for users is whether it feels like they're going to the right place each time. So you could have a relatively long chain of clicks. Obviously, you don't, still don't want to go way too many. But as long as people feel like each click is getting them closer to their destination, then that works pretty well. So we look at directness to measure how, how true that is, how how well people are able to follow a single path to get to it without backtracking. So Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Did you have any, um, did you need a minute to close out with any words or anything, or is this, um, we just have everyone finish completing this and in yeah. the back? Or... Yeah, I think people will start finishing in, within the first few minutes, I think. So um, if anybody has any questions as they're working through it, feel free to ask. 
I can't tell you where to click, but we can, <laughs> can tell you how to make sure the tool's working right for you. Okay, we should probably move on um, so that Bikash has enough time for his talk. Um, yeah. But yes. what people I would can recommend finish up while is, while yeah, talking. if people want to finish up, um, but also if you think this is a good exercise um, to share it with your uh, collaborators or your group, um, because the more data, the better for us. So um, that would be really great. Awesome. Okay, Koichi says he's done. And I also, I did it. I think I, hopefully I was allowed to do it. So um, I'm also done. So you know, hopefully we can move on now. Okay, yeah. awesome. Great. Thank you so much and for this exercise. And so we're looking forward to hear what the results will be. <laughs> Me too. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. So we will continue on back to our regularly scheduled program. And... So next up, we will be kicking off our early career award winner talks. Um, and so our first talk will be toward, will be from Abikash Kanango again. And it, his talk is titled Towards Large Scale Materials Modeling at Quantum Accuracy. And so just a little bit of background about uh, Bikesh. So he is currently Bikesh is currently a research scientist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and his research focuses on various theoretical and numerical aspects related to density function theory and time dependence uh, theory as well. So his work in involves developing machine learn exchange correlation functionals in DFT by drawing connections to quantum minibody methods. And in his work, he develops fast and scalable numerical methods ranging from efficient mixed spaces to acceler accelerated time propagators in HPC. And this enables us to achieve uh, exascale DFT calculations. Uh, Bakash received his PhD in mechanical engineering and scientific computing from the University of Michigan. And prior to being a research scientist, he worked as a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And so everyone, we would like to welcome uh, Bikash Kanango uh, for his talk today. And Bikash, are you ready to go? Yeah. Um, should I share my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Charles, for inviting me and for the introduction. Um, so, so the topic of my uh, talk would be towards large scale materials modeling at quantum accuracy. Um, so, typically by large scale, I I would mean both large length scale and time scale. But for this talk, I'll just restrict myself to large length scales. Uh, and by quantum accuracy, I mean the kind of accuracy you would expect from quantum many body calculations like quantum Monte Carlo or configuration interactions, those kind of calculations. Um, so you can interrupt me and ask questions if you have any, you don't have to wait till the end. Um, so regarding large scale materials modeling, so there are plenty of scientific applications where this is required. Uh, one such family of application is anything that has a defect in it. There we need large length scales to get realistic defect concentration, which comes in very sm small concentration in nature. For example, you would want, if you would want to study the splitting of water on defective semiconductors. So this is important for designing fuel cells or uh, how dislocations behave within a metallic alloy. So these are important in designing lightweight structural alloys or for example, spin defects in solid state materials. So these are promising qubit materials. Um, so for large time scale where you want to study the dynamics of the electron. So one such example would be studying plasmonics on metal nanoclusters. So plasmonics are collective motion of the electrons. And these are important to understand photovoltaics. So these are just some few examples to motivate why we need large scale materials modeling. 
and in all of these applications we also need quantum accuracy we we need the energies that we are computing or differences of energies to be accurate to one kilocalorie per mole or one milliheartry that regime um so so to if you want to do it the starting point would be solving the schrodinger many electron problem so if you are able to solve this problem you can derive all other material properties so but the trouble over here is that the computational complexity for solving the many electron problem grows exponentially with number of electrons so beyond a few tens of electrons this approach becomes kind of hopeless um, but this is where a breakthrough came in around mid 60s where people realized that you don't actually need to compute the many electron wave function psi as long as you can op use the density you can define all the material properties ground state material properties in terms of the density row so so the way it works is that if you're interested in the minimum energy of the system which is called the ground state energy you have to minimize over all the many body wave function and take the expectation of the hamiltonian but you can break this minimization into a two step minimization where you first minimize over all the density and then minimize over all the wave functions that yields the same density so so just a simple trick means that everything within the within the parenthesis um becomes a functional of the density it becomes a universal function so it's a simple trick it's a very simple um um uh, uh, theorem but it has profound implication all it tells us that now all the ground state properties can be defined in terms of the density the only trouble is that we don't know the functional form of it so this is where the genius of cohn and sham comes in so they are the founding fathers of density functional theory so they said let's imagine a system of non interacting electrons which yields the same density as the interacting one now the advantage of this non interacting set of electrons is that we can define them as single electron orbitals instead of a many body wave function we can define them as single electron orbitals and then we can write the energy or the other functional in terms of these three quantities so the f which is the universal functional of the density can be represented in terms of three quantities so the ts which is the non interacting kinetic energy then the eh or the hartree energy which is the classical coulomb interaction between uh, the electron density and then all other quantum many body interaction is clubbed into this term called the exchange correlation functional so we know that the exchange correlation functional is a unique functional of the density we don't know the form of it uh, so this is where all the modeling aspect in dft goes in so till this point dft in principle is an exact theory but we don't know the form of this exc uh, the exchange correlation functional and this is where the modeling aspect in dft comes in so now if we if one has to find the ground state density uh, and the ground state energy of the system one has to solve this minimization problem which results in a non linear eigen value problem so the eigen value problem to, that i have written this this is a non linear eigen value problem because the potentials in the eigen value problem depend on the density and the density itself depend on the eigen functions that you get out of it so one has to solve it in a self consistent way so you plug in the plug in a guess for the density that that fixes the potentials and and then you solve the eigen value problem with those potentials that gives you a set of eigen functions and then you find a new density from those eigen functions if it matches your guess for the density that you began with you're done or else you mix the two and recycle until you reach convergence so so the potentials that go into the eigen value problem so there are three different potentials so the so the first potential external potential is the potential coming because of the po from the nucleus so these are the coulomb potential from the nucleus then we have the hartree potential which is coming because of the classical coulomb interaction between the electrons and then all the many body effects are clubbed into the exchange correlation potential so this is the 
mean field potential that an electron feels due to the presence of all the other electrons. So, so this wraps up like the, the, the theory behind density functional theories. So what are the challenges in density functional theory? As I had just mentioned that density functional theory in principle is an exact theory, but in practice, one has to approximate the exchange collision functionals. And the existing functionals, they are very far from the quantum accuracy of one to five millihartry per atom uh, error in the energy. And typically, the existing functionals, they don't perform well when you go to strong electronic correlations. And there are many, many notable errors in all the existing functionals, like self-interaction error, dis derivative discontinuity errors. So these are some technical terms, but what it mean, means is that if you stretch, let's say, a molecule, the two atoms in a dimer, stretch them apart, as you keep on stretching, the error that you incur grows with the stretching. So these are the manifestations of these errors, like self-interaction or derivative dis discontinuity error. Also, if you're looking at fundamental gap, which is the um, difference between the ionization potential and electron affinity, like, like how easy or difficult it is to add or subtract an electron from a system, that gap is not predicted well by DFT functionals that are existing today. So there is at least an order of magnitude higher error than we would want them to have. Um, now this is these are all the accuracy challenges in DFT. So beyond the accuracy challenge, there is also a computational challenge. If you look at routine usage of DFT on any supercomputer, there would be the system sizes would range between 100 to 1000 atoms. And if you're looking at molecular dynamics, they would scale up to maybe those calculations would be limited up to few picoseconds. And in general, the existing methods, they, they scale very poorly. So ex reaching exascale is a real challenge in DFT. Um, so my work would be addressing these accuracy and computational challenges in DFT. Now to address the accuracy challenge, that is the improving the accuracy of the exchange correlation functional, we take a data-driven approach. So the idea is you calculate accurate downstate densities from quantum many-body calculations like quantum Monte Carlo or configuration interactions. So these try to solve the Schrodinger many electron problem directly but they can't scale. So they, they may scale about 200 electrons, um, but till this 100 electron system size, they give very accurate densities. So you take these densities uh, and the energies from them, and then ask the question that what is the potential in DFT, the exchange collision potential that recovers the same density that my many body calculations are giving me. So this is called the inverse DFT problem. So in, in, a, in a forward DFT or the general DFT problem, you are given the form of the potential and you are finding the density from it. Here you are given the density and you are finding what potential yields that density. Now the idea is that once we have this density and potential pairs from different systems, different atoms, molecules, and solids, we can then use machine learning to figure out the relation between the two. And that would help us to model the exchange correlation functional. So now in this workflow, a critical piece is the inverse DFT problem. So this inverse DFT problem, although it seems very simple, it had largely remained an open problem for past 20, 25 years because of the numerical challenges involved in it. Um, one numerical challenge arised from the fact that many of the densities that were used in the inverse calculations, they had the wrong asymptotics. For example, the electron density should have a cusp on, on the nuclear positions. So, so you can see like to the left, the green density doesn't have a cusp on the, so this is for the hydrogen molecule. So, so on, on each of the hydrogen atom in the inset, you see that the green one is what the typical Gaussian calculation, Gaussian densities that you get, which don't have a cusp on the atom. And the magenta one is the, is the one that has a cusp. So if these are very small differences, but if I take the green one and do an inverse calculation, I get these spurious oscillations in the potential that, that's given to the right. But if I take the one with the correct, correct cusp on the atom, they give me smooth potentials. So, so these tiny changes in the density can wreak havoc in the, in the potential in our inverse calculations. 
Also, when you discretize this problem, if you discretize it in an incomplete basis, such as Gaussian basis, then you can then it can lead to also spurious oscillations or non-unique solutions. So we had a recent breakthrough um, in solving the inverse DFT problem by using um, um, convergent finite element basis. So uh, I'll come to this finite element basis in a bit. Um, so this guarantees completeness and also well-posedness of this problem. So now we can solve this problem in an accurate way. Uh, and we have demonstrated it for like both uh, weakly and strongly correlated molecular systems. Um, so, so how do one pose an inverse DFT problem? So there are many ways to do it. The way we do it is pose it as a PD constraint optimization, where the task is to minimize the um, difference between a target density row data. So the target density is coming from the many body calculation and the Kohn-Sheim density row. Um, so we want to find the potential which minimizes this difference um, such that the density comes from the eigenvalue problem, the Kohn-Sheim eigenvalue problem. So this becomes a PDE constraint optimization. And the way we solve it is by uh, defining this Lagrangian, which has the original objective function of the mismatch between the densities, and then the PDE constraints built into it. Uh, so here, P alphas are the adjoint functions, which enforce the eigenvalue constraint on the psi alphas, the Kohn-Sheim orbitals. So, so if we minimize this Lagrangian with respect to the various um, uh, variables involved, we get this four set of optimality conditions, where the first two optimality conditions are nothing, but the uh, the constraints that we began with, that is the that that is the eigenvalue constraint and the normalization condition on the Kohn-Sheim orbitals, and then we get two additional equations. So the third one is the adjoint equation which solves for the adjoint functions P alphas. And then we have an additional orthogonality condition on the adjoint function. Now, once you solve these sets of um, these four equations, you can then find the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to your VXC. So, so this, this, this now forms the central equation to find the VXC via any gradient-based approach. It may be steepest descent or BFGS or whatever your favorite uh, optimizer is. So I had initially said that we need the right cusp on the density uh, at nuclear positions. To guarantee this, we add a small correction delta rho to the target density, um, which, which guarantees that we always maintain the cusp on the nucleus. So the way this delta rho is defined is that it is the difference between two densities, both coming from DFT calculations, one uses the finite element basis. So the finite element basis have C0 continuity. So they can admit a cusp on the atoms. And then the second density is the density coming from a Gaussian basis used in the many body calculation. So this delta rho is basically capturing the, the basis set, Gaussian basis set error on an atom. So this, this effectively corrects for the missing cusp. Um, also, the Gaussian densities that is coming from many body calculations, they don't have the right decay. So in the in the away from the atoms, we should expect an exponential decay, but Gaussian densities have a Gaussian decay. So they in turn can lead to spurious behavior in the potential in the far field. Now to uh, circumvent that, we apply appropriate boundary condition in the far field, which which maintains the known one over R decay in the potential. So combining all these ideas, how does it look like? So, so, so to the left is the exact potential for, for hydrogen molecules. So the green and the red one are, are obtained by using two different uh, cusp correction, uh, using the cusp correction using two different functionals. And both are almost the same. So we don't see any sensitivity to the way we apply the cusp correction to the density. Uh, just as a reference, the magenta one is how an approximate function, approximate potential would look like. So to the right are the exact potentials for a stressed and dissociated hydrogen. So these are prototypical strongly correlated systems. Um, 
So this is a more challenging example. So this is the orthobenzene molecule in which we obtain the exact potential. Um, and we also verify the Koopman's theorem, which says that the Koonsham, um, the highest occupied Koonsham orbital should have its eigenvalue negative of the ionization potential. So this is a known result, and we are numerically able to satisfy that through our approach. So now all this exercise tells us that we now have an accurate and robust way of solving the inverse DFT problem, which, which is crucial to get the training data to model the exchange correlation functional. Now, now, now that we have this training data for, um, so the training data involves the density and the potentials for various atoms and molecules. So using that, now our challenge is to model the exchange correlation functional. So the way we do it is we take very simple models like local and semi-local models. So by local model, I mean that uh, so the LDA is the local density approximation. Um, what it means is that the energy density, the exchange correlation energy density at a point R depends only on the density at that point R. Um, so the C over here is the spin density. So your electrons can, can have spin up or spin down. So we account for spin. So, but but essentially what it means is that the electron density at a point R depends only on the density at that given point. And similarly, we have gradient, uh, generalized gradient approximation, where uh, in addition to the density at that point, we also account for the gradient in the density at that point. So these are typically called local or semi-local model because they don't capture any non-local effects. That the, that the energy density at a point R doesn't depend on densities coming from other points. Uh, so, so, and then we define the loss in terms of the energy and the potential. Um, and so, so this is our final form. So we don't actually uh, model the entire thing using a neural network. So we pick a base model, an existing functional, and learn a correction on top of it for both the local and the semi-local, the LDA and the GGA functional. And we use a very simple neural network of three hidden layers with 18 neurons in each. Um, and, and we train them using very limited data, just four atoms and three, uh, sorry, five atoms and uh, three uh, and two, two molecules, that's it. So very limited data. And we test it out against a thermochemistry data set called the G2. This is a widely used thermochemistry data set to benchmark uh, functionals. What we observe is our both LDA and GGA functional in terms of total energy per atom, they are remarkably well. So they, they even outperform hybrid functionals, which are much more expensive uh, to calculate. Uh, of course, this is total energy. Mostly people are not interested in total energies. They're interested in differences in energies because that's what governs most of the physics and chemistry. So if we look at differences of energies, like atomization energies, uh, which is the energy of a molecule minus the energy of its constituent atoms, uh, what we see is, again, a significant improvement for the NN LDA over the most widely used LDA. And similarly, if you look at NN GGA, it, it provides um, significant improvement over PBE, which is the most widely used GGA. And scan and B3LIP, these are more sophisticated functional. So they have more ingredients built into them. So they are, they are typically more accurate, but they are also more expensive. Uh, so what it tells us is that using this neural net based functionals, we can use less information. So, I mean, a less sophisticated functional can achieve the same accuracy as a more sophisticated or more complex functional. For example, the NNGGA is reaching almost the scan level accuracy. So scan is a higher rung functional, which is, which is more expensive. The DFT calculations using scans are more expensive. So we see similar trend for barrier heights, like what is the height of a reaction? Um, so there similarly, the NNGGA that we have um, gives us similar accuracy to scan. So all these examples tell us that um, it provides the promise of these machine learned functionals um, for using extremely limited training data. 
Now, this is just the beginning. So we just showed the promise using very simple local and semi-local functionals. Um, the idea going forward is to build on top of it, bring more sophistication to these models, like go to meta GGS, like scan that I presented, that is one of the widely used functionals. Uh, so scan has additional information beyond the density and its gradient. Uh, the other uh, more interesting ideas that we are working on right now is to go to non-local models. And one way of incorporating non-local, non-locality into your model is to use fractional derivatives. Now, this is this this idea of fractional derivative has never been explored in electronic structure yet. So, fractional derivatives they naturally encapsulate non-local features, and you can also modulate the range of non-locality by picking different order of this fractional derivative. So, these are some of the ongoing things that we are trying out now. So, so, so this kind of wraps up like how we are trying to address the accuracy challenge in DFT. So I'll just switch gears and move to how we are trying to address the computational challenge in DFT, like how to enable large scale DFT as well as inverse DFT. So as I had alluded in the past, we, ha we are using finite elements. Um, so, so we try to exploit many features of the finite elements to make our calculations efficient. Um, specifically, we use the adaptive refinement that that finite element provides. Uh, so, and finite elements being local bases, they provide excellent parallel efficiency. And in particular, we use higher order finite elements because we see that as you keep on increasing the polynomial order in each finite element, uh, we get higher efficiency. Um, so, I'll I won't spend much time here. I'll go to the more interesting part. So. Um, so, so to do, so, so we have spent some time uh, uh, developing some high performance computing uh, innovations that help accelerate our DFT or inverse DFT calculations. One such trick is to consider the the key kernel in 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 our calculation, which is uh, multiplication of a sparse distributed matrix H. H with a dense matrix X. So this is sparse at a global level, but we can extract finite element level uh, matrices for both H and X, uh, which, which become dense, dense matrix multiplication. And now we can exploit the strided batch gems uh, within GPUs. So this guarantees us high arithmetic intensity. And we also make use of batching. So where we batch over few vectors in x so that we can now have asynchronous compute and communication so that while the compute is going on for one set of vectors the communication for another set of vectors is already start has already been started um and we also use mixed precision so some of the computations are done in double precision some which are less critical are done in single precision so these these help us boost the efficiency so all this work the bulk of the work Actually, the key people who have brought in these innovations are some my colleagues Sambit Das and Fani Mutamari. Uh, I'm kind of leveraging on these innovations to do my machine learned functionals and inverse DFT calculations. So all these innovations, they are part of the DFTFE open source package. Um, so I would, I would welcome you to check this out. So this is now released and well supported. Uh, if you need help installing it, installing and using it we reach out to us and we can help you with that um so how does all these innovations put together look like so let's first start with inverse dft so so we put in all these hpc innovations that i briefly discussed um so if we look at the strong scaling they give us excellent strong scaling behavior uh, so these are all done on permitter uh, in fact if we look at cpu to gpu speed up node to node we get a remarkable 18x speed up. So this actually tra translates to 50x reduction in wall time. So previously, the inverse DFT algorithm we had for, for a molecule like orthobenzyne, which has 10 atoms in it, it would typically take us seven days to complete the calculation. Now it would take a few hours, three to four hours. And, and why this is important is that as we keep on improve the 
sophistication of the machine learned exchange correlation functionals we would need more and more data as the as the expressivity of the model increases it would require more data to optimize uh, and hence this fast generation of this exact potentials through inverse dft will become crucial now all these innovations in inverse dft we are putting together uh, into a package uh, which will be released uh, i hope sometime in summer this year so 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 do watch out for that so this will be built on top of the dftfe package i i just mentioned in the previous slide so now coming to uh, moving from inverse dft to to forward dft the usual dft that you know of so putting all these innovations like taking the machine learned exchange correlation functionals and all the hpc innovations uh, what we did was we studied a very large scale system so the so the so the system is magnesium yttrium uh, alloy um, uh, with a dislocation grain boundary. So so this is like uh, a dislocation dislocation interaction. This, so these are very complex systems for DFT to handle because they require very large length scales. So in fact, this this one has close to seventy five thousand atoms uh, or six hundred thousand electrons. So these are one of the largest material simulation done at dft level and that too with these machine learned functionals which give us close to quantum accuracy now so 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 to the left is how it would have looked like if we would have used different levels of electronic structure calculation so 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 different levels of electronic structure calculations they have this pareto front where um where as you move from dft to quantum many body physics you increase in accuracy but the system size that you can scale to uh, diminishes so so th this is basically def it defines a trade off between what is the accessible accuracy and accessible system size so what this example that i showed of magnesium yttrium alloy tells us um, that with the use of this machine learned functionals we are able to breach this this trade off this pareto front now uh, and in terms of performance metric this calculation uh, achieved around 660 petaflops so quite getting close to that exascale mark uh, at a 43% uh, uh, fp64 peak performance on 8000 frontier nodes so this now this is now the record sustained performance for any calculations ever and in terms of um, how it compares to previous previous watermark it is around 10 times better than the previous record. And this effort has been um, honored with last year's Gordon Bell Prize. Um, and th this was a joint effort with Sambit Das and uh, Vishal Subramanian. Um, so, so I guess that wraps up my talk. So, so all these efforts are still ongoing. Like there are, there is still a long way to go to uh, scale these calculations to even larger systems and also improve uh, the accuracy of the exchange correlation functionals that I have mentioned. Um, and yeah, so these are just initial days of this line of work. And anyone interested uh, in using the ideas or collaborating with us, they're highly welcome. Um, so maybe I'll stop here and take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, that wonderful talk and congratulations again on your early, co early career award as well as mm -hmm. your Gordon Bell Prize Award too. Thank you. Uh, did we have any questions from anybody on the call? So I guess if you could go back one or two, yeah, right here. Yeah. So, um, yes, right here. So with your current work towards focusing on the scalability of the electrons, what do you feel is going to be um, some of the other optimizations that can be done to help improve um, the ability for for the algorithm to scale towards incorporating a larger system size? What might be some opportunities or ways in which you 
think your your group will investigate? So one idea we're still exploring um, is the idea of a mixed basis. So I discussed finite element basis. So we can still improve the efficiency of the basis in the sense that, uh, let's say we are taking roughly 10,000 uh, basis functions per atom to, to get to desired, a desired accuracy. Can we cut it down to 1,000 or 2,000 basis functions per atom? And that is doable by using a mixed basis where we have the finite element basis, but we augment it with atom-centered basis. Um, so, so that can drastically cut down the number of basis functions required, and, and then we can ideally scale to larger system sizes. So, so that is one way. The other approach is a conceptually very different approach that some people have tried just proof of concept, but no one has given it a serious push um, is the idea of using partition DFT. So where you have a large system and you partition the system. Um, so, so, okay. So, so, so what is the revolutionary idea in DFT? It, it tells us that we solve in, we solve single electron system where each electron feels the presence of the other electrons through a mean field potential, the exchange correlation potential. So you can extend the same idea, say that, okay, you have different partitions. So each partition can have few atoms and then you can have millions of such partitions. And you can effectively say that each partition now feels the presence of the other partitions through a mean field potential. So they don't have to explicitly see the other partitions. So they just feel the presence of the other partitions through a potential. So so that can give you almost a linear scaling algorithm for DFT instead of a cubic scaling. So that can be a game changer. Um, but th these are just uh, proof of concepts that have been shown so far. We don't we don't know yet what would be the numerics and HPC challenges going forward. But on paper, it looks promising. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? And I know we're over time. So thank you all that were still able to stay on the call. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone. All right, well, thank you again, um, Bikash. And again, congratulations on the outstanding work you're doing. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, what your the future research entails and the directions that your group is going to take. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for honoring me with the award and inviting me for the talk. Well deserved. Well deserved. Thank you. Um, did we have any other questions from anyone or any closing remarks from any nurse staff or anyone else on the call? And thank you, Annette, for the tree testing um, demo and experiment. So we're looking forward to that, uh, improving how our users navigate and can find documentation is um, definitely important. So we appreciate all the work that you're doing and trying to improve our user experience too. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I think we will call our call for today at, to an end. And we are looking forward to uh, more calls in the future. And please uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, you need help please always submit a ticket um, and let us know how we can help you just advance your science in the best way possible. All right, everyone, until next time, we will see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you.